thanks everyone for coming to our last distinguished lecture of the year. It's my <laughs> <laughs> our last and best. Uh, I'll make the, the the claim. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce Lillian Lee. Lillian is one of my absolute favorite natural language processing researchers. Uh, she has the amazing ability to really take a problem and study it very carefully, make fundamental contributions at last. Uh, so for example, she did some of the early uh, work in a, in a number of different areas, including distributional semantics, paraphrase, uh, sentiment analysis, and NLP for social interaction and social understanding, uh, like we'll see in the talk today. So thank you, Lillian. Thank you, Luke. All right, great. Thank you very much. For, if I had known this was the last one, maybe I would have prepared a little better. But, um, <laughs> Thank you so much for the invitation. It's a real honor to be here. Uh, I've met some of you today, but not everybody. And so some of you may, those of you who know me know I'm a really informal person, but uh, so therefore feel free to ask me questions at any time. But usually no one has any questions now. So to get things sort of rolling, I thought I'd ask you a couple of questions. Uh, how many of you do natural language processing? Wow. How many of you do computational social science? Good. How many of you have seen Star Wars 4? <laughs> OK, good. This will come into play later on in the talk. <laughs> All right, so the premise of this talk starts from the following observation, which is that there are lots of online conversations in the world. I want to uh, have the notion of online conversation to me can be broadly construed. There's sort of the obvious stuff, like things on Facebook and Reddit, which are clearly you have lots of conversation threads. But also things like YouTube comments or comments on other sort of blogs also can form conversations, of course. And then things even like reviews on review aggregation sites. Often these reviews may be seemingly written independently, but may refer to each other. So there's just a wide range of things that we can consider uh, conversations. Uh, given that, what is a conversation? Well, one, way, one thing I can think of it as being is a, is a situation in which humans are interacting, right? Which means that if there are lots of online conversations, that there are many systems out there with humans and language as being key components, and therefore, all in orange, boldface, fantastic opportunities for NLP and the social sciences exist. And I'm supposed to be very excited about that, and that's going to be the pitch. Okay, what are these opportunities? They're hopefully to improve these systems that are out there already, and hopefully to create new ones. So to kind of give you the outline of the talk, I wanted to give, I'm going to be talking about two projects in this vein of combining NLP and the social sciences. It's hard to boldface things in speech, but I'm trying. Um, I'm going to give you first some movie trailer versions of the two projects. So the first project uh, sort of is, revolves around the question of who's in charge. So if I gave you a setting like this, which is uh, someone is arguing in front of the Supreme Court, it's sort of obvious who's in charge just from looking at them. Uh, Scalia up here is, sit, is up higher than this person here. He's wearing robes or is he's in ordinary dress. Lots of visual signals as to who's in charge. But suppose I said you can't look at the people. You can only listen to what they're saying. Okay, so I'm only going to look at their language. And furthermore, I'm not going to even show you all their language. I'm going to show you only redacted transcripts, if you will, of their conversations. I've removed all the content words. Can you still tell who's in charge from that? And I'm going to argue in a project that we can do that. Uh, so why is this interesting? So why do that? For one thing, I think it's interesting to see how much of our social interactions and social relations are reflected even in the little words, the supposedly unimportant words in what we say. Also, so if you aren't paying attention to the words that are specific to a particular topic or domain, then you can hope that your techniques will generalize to other domains. So not only will I study Supreme Court uh, conversations, but also in this talk I'll be talking about what these are, Wikipedians. This is like the Wikipedia head. So I'll also be looking at conversations between Wikipedians. And if the clues we're looking for aren't domain dependent, then clearly we hope they should be able to transfer to this totally different domain. Okay, so that's project one. The second project, the question is, does phrasing affect memorability? Uh, and again, here's my sort of movie trailer version of this. This all got started in uh, thinking about questions like the following. Back in the run-up to the 2008 elections, Obama said this thing. You can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. This thing in the purple is sort of an unusual thing to say. Non-native speakers may not even know what it means, and I'm not going to explain it now. It's complicated. But, um, <laughs> This phrase, it's striking and strange as it is, actually turned out to go viral. It got picked up in the press and echoed a lot. People were talking about the fact that he said lipstick on a pig. So this uh, phrasing went viral, if you will. Now, 
I'm interested in questions of whether how you phrase things affects how other people receive it. Do people remember it well? Are they convinced by it and the like? So I was sort of interested. I thought the phrasing lipstick on a pig is so unusual and striking that that's why it got picked up in the press. Okay. But my political science friends actually said, no, 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 you don't understand. So it turned out earlier, Sarah Palin had made this joke about what's the difference between a hockey mom and a bulldog, pit bull, lipstick, lipstick right? And so there had happened to be a reference to lipstick in the popular press before, so people would argue that actually the virality of this phrase, lipstick on a pig, had nothing to do with the sort of phrasing of it per se, but just the fact that there's a cultural coincidence. It happened to resonate with something that had happened in the culture, and it had nothing to do with the wording. Okay, so my question is, what, did the wording actually have an effect in, in the fact that uh, lipstick on a pig went viral? And is there any way we can prove that it had an effect independent of the cultural context in which it happened? Okay, so that's going to be my second project, two projects to get through in the 50 minutes. Now, finally, I'd like to make a remark about style. So I was really influenced by something my advisor, Stuart Cheever at Harbor, said some while ago. Um, actually, the older I get, the more and more I realize how right Stuart was. So there's something he said, which I'd like to share with you today. I'm going to paraphrase it. Those of you who know Stuart know he has this sort of inimitable style. It's really great, but it's actually kind of hard to read. So I straightened it out a little bit here. He said, when you're giving talks or writing a paper, presenting your work in general, your goal is not to convince your audience that you are brilliant, but that your solution is trivial. Now, you may find that surprising, especially the grad students in the, in the audience are often like, but the whole point is just to prove to the world how smart I am. Okay, but that's not actually what it's about. At least I seem to be learning this as I get older, uh, which is right, that this is not your goal. Now, Stuart points out that this is actually a hard road to hoe. It takes a certain strength of character to take that as one's goal. Okay, I got to admit, you take, if you adopt this kind of presentation style, your papers will get rejected more often. People will often be saying, you know, this was obvious, there's no contribution to the literature. Okay, and that's rough and that's hard when you don't get your papers in. But try to keep in mind that your goal isn't necessarily to prove to the world how smart you are by the length of your CV, but to, you know, improve science and make advances in the state of the, in how, in what we know, then given that, if people think your findings are obvious, they must also believe you are correct. Okay, and that's something I really have found very profound and try to live by. So if nothing else, after you leave this talk and you're like, everything shed that was obvious, know that I did it on purpose, okay? All right. Anyway, so on to my first uh, project here. This is joint work with a man with a very long last name, Danes Christian Danescu Nicolescu Mizu, my previous PhD student, Bo Pong, who was also a previous PhD student of mine, and John Kleinberg, colleague at Cornell. And remember the little cartoon picture here. The question is, can we tell who's in charge just by looking at very, a very reduced version of the signal, uh, the speech signal, if you will? OK, so why would you care about finding out who's in charge looking at people's language? So I pulled up some event, example motivation applications. So here are some example motivating applications. For one, directly wondering if you can tell who's in charge. I think it'd be really cool to have sort of proactive task discussion management systems. I've been talking to a couple of people here about how a lot of my research is sort of motivated by faculty meetings. So, you know, sometimes these meetings happen where it's not clear who's in charge or too many people are in charge or someone needs to be in charge. It would be some Snickers, I'm not sure what that means. But it would be nice if, you know, on the online conversation setting, maybe we could detect when this is happening and then have a system that having detected that could help get the conversation back on track. So that's sort of an immediate application of knowing who's in charge or whether anyone's in charge. Uh, sort of the longer term vision here are what might be termed conversation facilitation systems. I would love it if we could somehow come up with systems that could detect uh, imminent flame wars before they start. You know, everyone talks about how the online world is uh, causing people to become more polarized than ever. If we could just, you know, it sounds like a utopian dream, but if we could notice that conversations were going south a little bit before things actually became contentious, maybe we could improve the quality of online discourse. Uh, here's another example here, measuring engagement in MOOC, setting, MOOC settings. Uh, I'm sure UW is into the whole MOOC thing, are you? Yeah. So the idea is, though, you know, in these sort of distributed education settings, if we could, by looking at the interactions people are having, notice how engaged people are, I think that would also be very useful in other applications as well. But that's the idea, kind of a global view of having these sort of conversation analysis and facilitation systems. It's kind of the long-term vision here. Okay. 
So now, I want to talk to you about how language reveals power relationships between people. Now, sometimes it's real easy to tell uh, from language who's in charge. So I've got this little picture up here. This person is saying, Your Honor, I agree. This person is saying, Thank you. It is obvious in this case who's in charge. This person here has used an honorific. You know, it's quite clear. So I'm actually just showing you this example first to say there are cases when it's really easy, things like honorifics and certain sort of set phrases. And second, to introduce a color coding scheme I'm going to be using throughout. So the purple here is supposed to mean you're talking to someone who is above you. So think of the royal purple. OK. The green thing here is supposed to indicate you're talking to someone who is green, who is below you, is a greenie. OK. So purple means talking up. Green means talking down. OK, so there are these sort of honorific and set phrase kind of things. Uh, you can think about the harder setting. So here, uh, this is from the corporate uh, emails, the Enron Corp is here. So you can see this person here says, I'd love to get your thoughts on this when you are available. Or this one says, let's discuss later. Also clear who's in charge, right? Hank here probably, no. Um, don't you get to say, let's discuss later? That's the chair's prerogative, right? <laughs> Whereas the person here in purple talking up is going, when you're available, please talk to me. I'd love to get your thoughts. OK, it's not 100% obvious. Were you going to say something? That's you. <laughs> but right, so you have, again, these kind of phrases. And I've actually, what uh, I've, on the next animation here, highlighted come from Eric Gilbert's study. And other people have looked at this as well. Again, these kind of set phrasings that kind of help you uh, indicate, no, no, when someone's in charge. But as I mentioned to you before, I'm interested in general domain independent signals. This feels very corporate speak. This is obviously sort of Supreme Court kind of things. Are there kind of domain independent signals I can use? So here's the intuition behind this work. It comes from, I think, a very nicely phrased uh, remark from Jamie Pennebaker and uh, Kate Niederhofer, who said that communicative behaviors are patterned and coordinated like a dance. And I think that's a really nice image to keep in mind, nice metaphor here. If we push on that metaphor a little more, we might say, well, if people are dancing when they're talking, I can add, my question translates to the question of who has the lead? Who has the lead? OK. And if I were watching people dancing, it'd be pretty clear how I could find out, right? I'd say, who seems to be initiating a movement versus the other person seems to be reacting? Not necessarily doing exactly what the other person do, is doing, but reacting immediately to that other person. OK, so what we wanted, so in the language case, here's the kind of uh, pattern coordination that I want to look at. So let's imagine that this is Uma Thurman and uh, John Travolta in Pulp Fiction. They're dancing, but they're also talking. And I notice that every time Uma uses a preposition and then a uh, determiner, John Travolta also uses a preposition and a determiner. Not necessarily the same one. She said two, he said at. But he's still echoing the kind of function class words that she's, he, he's echoing her usage of function class words. And let's suppose this continues throughout the conversation. Then I might assume that Uma has the conversational lead, so to speak. OK, so what we're going to do, inspired by Niederhofer and Pennebaker, is look for this function class matching, uh, it's a, which has been said by Niederhofer and Pennebaker to be unconscious, which I'll argue is a good thing for us in uh, the next slide, and also frequent, which is a good thing for us, because we want to use it to detect things about what people are talking about. So this idea of echoing seems to be an intuitive way to go about this. But I want to say we don't want to just talk about direct repetition, hence the little x through the parrot here. So why not? So direct repetition has some uh, properties that are not so good for us in terms of the study we're trying to do. Number one, it's under the speaker's control. So we'd like to know who's in charge, no matter who is trying to seem like they're in charge. Okay? And if someone could actually directly amp this up by purposely not mirroring you, for instance, you know, that doesn't change the fact that Hank is uh, more powerful than Luke in a particular situation, even if he's trying to control it consciously through his language. Okay, so we don't want things that are consciously sort of uh, under the speaker's control. Uh, the second thing, and this is important, we want to rule out the possibility that the kind of echoing is something based on topic. So if you and I come together and we decide to talk about the Seahawks, did you guys win or lose? You won, right? <laughs> we're going to talk about the Seahawks. There are certain words we're just going to have to use, Seattle, Seahawks, et cetera, et cetera. So the topic causes us to so, so use similar words, even though it's not that I'm talking to Hank and he's causing me to use the word Seahawks. It's just the topic that's causing us. So since I'm interested in this direct relationship between the people, I want to avoid echoing that seems to be just induced by topic. OK? All right. So again, that's why we want this unconscious thing. 
And then frequency we want simply so that we can actually pick it up in actual conversations. If we're talking about a rare signal, then it might not be of so much use to us. All right, so how might we measure this? So the question I want to focus on here is we want to measure how much does a speaker x1 immediately using, whoops, how much does speaker x1 using function word class C, say a preposition, how much does x1 using a preposition immediately trigger x2 to use that prep, a, a preposition in the exact next utterance? Okay, so we're looking for a very short-term, immediate sort of notion of influence. Okay, because that's kind of a strong signal here. I'm gonna, it'll be convenient to kind of flip uh, terminology here, and instead of talking about x1 triggering x2, I'm gonna convert this to how much does x2 coordinate to x1? All right, how are we going to measure this? Here's a sort of obvious thing you might do. You might say, given that x1 has used, say, a preposition and x2 is immediately replying, how much is it likely that x2 is gonna use that preposition? And that seems natural. But we have to control for these things like topic, right? And we also need to do things like, you know, I'm talking to Luke and I'm using prepositions and he's using prepositions. Does that mean I influenced him? But what if Luke uses prepositions all the time? God help him, um, right? That doesn't mean that I influenced him because he would have used them regardless of what I was saying. So we're gonna subtract off this. What I have to subtract off the probability that X2 is gonna use a preposition anyway. And in fact, I'm gonna do something even stronger. I'm gonna say I'm gonna subtract off the probability that Luke uses prepositions whenever he's talking to me. Because maybe these two specific individuals have a habit of talking about things that involve prepositions. Okay, so I'm trying to control out for all these things to, maybe ensure, to make sure that what we're seeing is a direct influence in the speech from one utterance to the next. Quick intuition check, can this quantity be negative? Couple nods. Let's see more nods. Believe me, it can be negative. Think about the case where Luke has decided to defy me. Okay, so I'm using a preposition, so say Luke uses prepositions all the time, but in the conversation with me right now, he refuses to respond to me. Okay, then we're actually gonna get a zero here and whatever positive probability we have here. So it's possible for people to diverge. And in fact, a very early study, not using this particular metric though, looked at Watergate transcripts and they found things like Dean, I don't know how much US history, but there was an aide of Nixon who used to be in favor in the little Watergate bunch and in uh, Nixon's circle, but then he fell out of favor and you could see that that aide is starting to diverge in his uh, communication style with Nixon. Okay, so it's not that we necessarily always accommodate to each other. Sometimes this thing can go negative. Okay, any questions? All right, given that. So what actually happens in a certain setting? So let's take the case of the US Supreme Court. It's a fascinating corpus. Uh, the oral, so what this is is a corpus of the oral arguments before the Supreme Court. Uh, this is not lawyer against lawyer. It's each lawyer is talking to the justices. Okay, and in this case, it's extremely clear who's in charge. The justices are up here, they're in charge. The lawyers are, have lesser status with respect to them. Okay, so what is this chart showing? So let's ignore this part here. But so each of these things shows a particular, sorry, I guess I'm not ignoring them, shows a particular function word class, such as prepositions. Okay, and this measure here shows just an aggregate, various ways of aggregating over all possible function word classes. This axis here shows the amount of coordination. So you see in this case, everything's positive. So in fact, everyone was positively coordinating to each other, even though we just proved on the previous slide it can be negative, so that's a finding. But what are these different colored bars? Okay, so you remember my color coding thing? Yay. Okay, so the purple bars are the case where someone of low status is talking to someone of high status. In this case, a lawyer is talking to a justice. Whereas the green bars are when someone of high status, the justice is talking to a lawyer, low status. And you'll notice that all the purple bars are higher than the green bars. So, and these stars here mark levels of statistical significance. So a single star is P level 0.05, double is 0.01, and triple is 0.001. Highly statistically significant differences between when low status talks to high, low status talks to high status versus high status talks to low status. Absolutely clear. Now at this point, usually some people raise some objections. Uh, in the purposes of time, I will state what objections I usually have here. So, okay, so it looks pretty clear, but you can say a couple of things. First, you might say, well, the Supreme Court is such a ritualized kind of thing. It's a very unusual setting. This isn't a particularly realistic kind of situation. Maybe this doesn't occur in real conversations. A second um, 
objection that usually comes about, it's a little more subtle. Uh, you might say, this isn't really about the power relationships between these people. Maybe a specific certain kind of person gets to become a Supreme Court justice. And that kind of person is the kind of person who doesn't tend to echo what other people say. OK. So I don't know what this says about Hank. But so, the, this would say this is not about power per se. It's about personality. OK, and then there are other possible objections we'll also hope to get to. But given that I know these objections, I hope we can overrule them. <laughs> Thank you. So we can do this by looking at a different setting. So remember how I sort of foreshadowed looking at Wikipedians? Let me tell you about Wikipedian conversations. So behind the scenes of Wikipedia, there are all these Wikipedians, Wikipedia editors, who are having all sorts of conversations about things that should happen on Wikipedia. Should we delete this article? Should we amend this policy, et cetera, et cetera? And there, is a status, there are status hierarchies in there. So there are people who are admins, okay, and then there are people who are not admins. So we have this status relationship, this power relationship again. Uh, so furthermore, we have the following thing, which is someone is not just born an admin. They get voted to become an admin in a completely transparent process. You can see the entire record of votes and everyone's reasoning and so on and so forth. So that means there's a change in status. Not a change in human being, but a change in status. OK, which is obviously dealing with the objection I just raised. So let me show you this picture here. So this is time. And this Wikipedian here is standing for election as an admin. And the little crown here means that this point in time, actually at this point in time in the yellow, yellow's for the crown, they were elected an admin. OK, so at that point, their status changed. What are we seeing with their level of coordination? This is the coordination level. We see that their level of coordination is here. And then after they become elected an admin, suddenly their level of coordination is dropping with respect to other people. So you know it's not personality. It's actually about the role. Okay. And we're not doing Supreme Court. We're doing a totally different domain. Cool? What's this other line here, by the way? This is all the other people. Notice that they're coordinating not so much to Mr. or Ms. Candidate, but once they get that golden crown, suddenly they start coordinating up to them. Okay. So you're seeing exactly this level of coordination uh, corresponding to the difference in the power. Questions? Yeah. So it could also be true that status actually affects personality. So could sorry. People, when people feel that their, their perceived status changes, their personality can also change. So can you measure that in two conversations with the same person talking to people below him and above him, oh, so that, 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 okay. that his uh, language changes. Otherwise, it could be a measure of the, this person's personal um, status independent of the specific conversation we are having. OK, so I'm supposed to repeat that question. Um, the question is, is this really about power, or could it be that the person's actual personality changed based on their role, I guess would be a way to summarize that. Uh, and so, and then an experiment was suggested to test that. We haven't done the experiment to test it. Um, I do think there is clearly a personality element involved. Because notice that these people who won started up actually higher than these people. There's an actually interesting differential, which says something about people who tend to win elections, get the crown, actually tend to start with higher levels of coordination. And in fact, we've shown, we did this also with the people who lose the elections, and they actually start lower. So there is a person, so first of all, just to say, the obvious fact there, there's a difference in personality which affects uh, your level of accommodation that's independent of status. But that's not surprising, right? Some of us are just natural born echoers, no matter what. OK. Uh, the second thing, though, shoot, what was I going to say? It's gone. Um, yes, but I think the fact that I don't think you could count on every, well, so then there comes a confusion. What is personality versus? your actual role. And that, I don't think, is something I don't want to get into necessarily. But to actually study, I think, the answer to your question, we'd actually have to say, is personality an inborn thing, or can that actually change? OK. Other questions? OK, so there's usually one more objection that happens here, which I need to overrule, is, which is the following. So all these things were sort of about status, like in an org chart. You're an admin or are not. You're a Supreme Court justice or you're not. I don't have to do your fancy language analysis to figure that out. I can look it up in a list. OK, so the question can come up. Can we find power relationships that just aren't social status kind of things, that aren't just org chart kind of things? OK, 
So in fact, here's a little study which points to the possibility that we can actually see a sort of situational, uh, social, a situational power differential. Okay, so here's the idea. In Supreme Court, so power differences, this is a theory, uh, what's it called? Um, exchange, the exchange theoretic argument by Emerson, that power differences can arise from dependence. The idea is if I need something from you, you have power over me. If I don't need something from you, you have less power over me. Okay. So in the case of these lawyers arguing before the justices, you can have sort of two situations, and this is based on a sort of peculiarity about the US Supreme Court, which is people's, the justices' sort of leanings, if you will, are pretty well known. So before you even step in the courtroom, the lawyers have a pretty good idea which way the justices are gonna vote, okay? So given that, you have two situations. As a lawyer, you can be talking to someone who already has your opinion, okay, so you don't really have to change their mind, versus who's someone who has the opposite opinion, who's uh, pre, 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 pre who's predisposition <laughs> is to vote against you. And those are people who you need to change their mind, you know, in order to win their vote. And as you can see from the color coding, I can interpret that as a change, as a difference in power that isn't an org chart thing. You're talking to Supreme Court justices, but some of them you need more than others. So there's a difference in power relationship between the ones you need to change their minds and the ones you don't. Okay, and then you can see here again, you've got the same thing, difference between the purple bars and the green bars is significant in most aspects and certainly in our aggregated measures. So again, you're seeing this accommodation of behavior being correlated with difference in power level between the participants, okay? All right, and then if you're an ACL reviewer, you have a final objection, which is, well, there's that, <laughs> and there's nothing I do about that. Where's the prediction results? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, you observe some things, show me some machine learning, okay. So um, we can make this into a prediction task as follows. So you can take a pair of people and try to decide, based on their language interactions alone, who is in charge, who has more power than the other one. Okay, so let me do some sort of uh, baseline, uh, walk you through the following chart, which has some baseline stuff. You could say, I'm gonna take Supreme Court, I'm gonna train my classifier, trying to decide who's in power, on Supreme Court, transcripts and test on uh, Supreme Court transcripts and use various classifiers on that. I can use just the standard bag of words things. I can use your fancy smancy coordination thing or I could use stylistic features. Stylistic features are I'm gonna use that part of speech stuff you were talking about before but not look at whether the parts of speech are being echoed by each other. Okay, so the question there is just is it part of speech features alone that are giving you whatever power your claimed accommodation stuff gives you. Uh, this line here is the difference for 50%. Okay, so 50%, if you were here, that means you're predicting at 50% accuracy, which for us is random chance, so I'm calling it zero. So who's doing really well here? Bag of words. That's almost 100%. Why is it doing so well? Yeah? Your Honor, in the Supreme Court, you can just look at specific words and you're practically 100% right. Oh my God. It's gonna be very hard to beat that. The star here means different, uh, statistically significantly different from zero. Okay, and then we can look at our coordination features and you go, well, it's not doing as well as that, but at least it's significantly better than zero. Okay, and these stylistic features, you're like, oh, those aren't even significantly different from zero. So this accommodation stuff, it's not just about the parts of speech. Could we have gotten into www with this result? No, okay. Let's try a different example though. So I could take change domains, right? Because I'm interested in this cross domain kind of thing. So here we're using Wikipedia as the train and test stuff, these Wikipedian conversations. And notice, hey, wait a minute, bag of words is suddenly stinking. Because it's a lot harder to tell. The people are talking about various things. They're just ordinary people on the street. We don't have these honorifics that are helping us tell. They don't say, dear Mr. Admin or Ms. Admin, will you, you know, approve uh, this? And then you can see, okay, hey, yay, we're at least above statistically different from zero in both cases, whereas the other things aren't. Is this good enough to get us into dub, dub, dub? Well, it might be, you know, I can make kind of a case here, blah, blah, blah. But there's all this blank stuff here on the slide. What do you think is about to happen? <laughs> Train and test on different domains, because I was trying to argue that these things are good for different domains, okay? So if I train and test on different domains, I train on court or test on wiki or vice versa, you can see that the coordination things are still statistically better than random choice, whereas actually the bag of words thing is going below because it's overfitting. Okay, so what's the only thing across all the conditions that is remains statistically different from random chance? Us 
Yay, OK. <laughs> all right, that's all I have to say about this project. I will be happy to take some questions now. Yeah? How does it compare against a person reading the dialogue? What's that? So mm. admin, non-admin. Right. Classification. So you can ask, what's the human performance here? So on Supreme Court, it's really easy. On uh, the Wikipedia stuff, we actually ran some baselines sort of on ourselves, and we were actually pretty bad. It was 60%. Because they're just talking about stuff, and who's going to delete this, and you know, it actually turns out to be hard. Now, maybe we're just stupid, but you know. So you said 60%. Yeah. That's oh, I'm sure it's better than coordination. This. Yeah, so let me make a remark here. You might be like, actually, if I were the dub 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 reviewer, I wouldn't have let this in. You may have those stars, but you're really talking about a very small improvement. Let me note that, and I know there's a question here in the back, let me note a couple of things about this. One is, Bag of Words is getting 20,000 features. We're just based on nine. Okay, so what we wanted to prove here was that with a very simple feature set, you could do much better than Bag of Words. If you wanted to improve this particular bar's actual performance, you would, of course, combine it with Bag of Words and blah, 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 blah. We were not here into improving our numbers as best we could, more as to just prove a point that these have very good uh, cross-domain performance with re in comparison to something like Bag of Words for a lot fewer features. Could you talk a bit about the no, statistic wait. features you chose? What? Could you talk a bit about the statistic features you chose for the? Uh, I could. It's not super worth it. So there are nine different uh, function class function classes we use. They are based off of Luke. I actually don't believe those are necessarily the right classes. So I'd rather just to say that they were, for those of you who don't do NLP, they were uh, classes based on some predefined list. And maybe otherwise I'll take that off. But that's kind of a detail about the feature engineering. And I, I'm not committed to that particular feature class at all. Yeah. So are the honorifics a strong baseline in the case of you trying to convince a justice Given ah. that they don't. So the question was, are the honorifics a good way to actually convince the justice, as opposed to just tell, are you a lawyer or not? Um, actually, so there are very, this is an interesting thing, because you're asking a question about persuasion. So there are many scholars who believe that actually the oral arguments play no difference, play no role in the actual decision. So you guys know that who, which justice is not in this data set? How come? So Clarence Thomas never says anything. Okay, and I mean, it was actually news when he said something. Did you see this New York Times article? No one knows what he actually said, but it was news that he said something. Okay, but why doesn't he participate? There are many reasons stated and uh, speculated on, but one reason he said is that these really play no role. It's just a little charade or a, not charade, a, far, a kind of far, there's some word I'm reaching for, uh, where people are just trying to show, my colleagues are just trying to show off their edition and it's a nice little display kind of thing, but these actually have no influence on our actual decisions. It's a, it's a not a farce, some, something like that. It's a, no. <laughs> what? Sure, I'm trying for charade, yeah, okay. So trying to measure whether something actually influenced something in this data set, there are people who argue actually nothing is actually cause, having an effect in the end. And that's a question for jurisprudence scholars, not, not for me. Um, you can imagine other things where we might look for it. And in fact, Christian Donescu Christian Nicolescu Mizil, the first author here, has done some work on looking at whether politeness causes uh, effects to happen that you might want. And I'll refer you to that work. Uh, let me take one more question before moving on to the second. You guys are right next to each other. Is there any chance you can telepathically have the same question? <laughs> words into nine classes instead of using each of them individually as a feature. Okay, so that was a question again about these nine classes. Could you combine them into a single feature, et cetera? I think there are lots of different ways you could have actually implemented this particular measure. And to be honest, I'm not particularly committed to these kind. We picked these nine because they seem to be not particularly topic related and we didn't want to have topic. But as to how do you actually you know, implement this, we just wanted the simplest possible thing because we wanted to say, even if you took the most dumb way to do this, you will still get good results. That's kind of the way. So um, basically, if you're going, boy, you took the most obvious way to do this, I could do a lot better, and you go on and work with it, I win. OK? So <laughs> all right, speaking of moving on, let me go on to the second part of my talk. Remember the kind of little movie trailer version here is Obama's lipstick on a pig remark. Uh, this is joint work with Christian Donescu Nicolescu Mizil. Uh, Justin Chang, who was an undergrad at Cornell, and my Cornell colleague, John Kleinberg. Okay, 
So the question we were interested in here was, does phrasing affect memory? Okay, so one thing is I'm interested in influence. Influence is a little bit hard to measure, but we can back off a little bit and think about at least memorability. You could argue that if I can't even remember what your argument was, I couldn't possibly be influenced by it. Okay, so we're gonna back off and think about whether phrasing affects memorability. Why do we care? Well, a couple, I think it's intrinsically interesting. Again, in my faculty meeting life, I would like to be able to persuade my colleagues of various things, and it'd be great if they could remember that I said this instead of the guy next to me who just repeated what I said and got the credit. Anyway, so some motivations are we'd like to rank perhaps what material to promote. You can imagine doing something with Twitter feeds or the like where you'd say, this is more likely to be memorable, let's rank it higher. Uh, also, as I said, understanding things like influence and the like, uh, I think this has uh, relationships. Uh, there's much related work in various fields, and I've just put up some references here. Okay, but if we're gonna study this question, remember my conundrum with lipstick on a pig. There are various things I needed to control for that seemed like you couldn't possibly be able to control for. So first of all, what even counts as data? What kind of things are out there that are memorable or not memorable? And given that, you know, you have to be able to decide which, is, which are gonna be your positive examples. And the kind of killer thing here is I want to be able to tease apart language from context. I want to be like, even, uh, I wanna be able to say, well, I wanna be able to control for context and say, okay, there was an actual effect of the different phrasing here that caused something to be memorable, more memorable than something else. Okay, so how are we gonna do this? Uh, so I asked you a question about movies. Most people have seen the movie I asked about. Most people have certainly seen a movie. Movies are something that are deeply culturally embedded, at least in the US. Everyone seems to care about them. And movie quotes are something that tend to go massively viral. So this is gonna be the data we use. People care so much about memorable quotes that this is an ad for a three hour special television event on CBS simply about what are the 100 most famous movie quotes. And there are things like, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. I'm gonna make him an offer he can't refuse, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so we have some data, these quotes, okay? And you can see that this is something that's actually, I think it's actually in some sense a better domain than political quotes, because not everyone talks about political quotes, you know, around the water cooler, but lots and lots of people are talking about movie quotes. So you kind of have a more culturally embedded kind of data set to work with. Okay. Now. So we need to control for a context and the like. I'm gonna show you a little example that'll hopefully motivate the controls that we did. So this is a scene from Star Wars Episode Four. You may remember it, seeing as many of you have seen it. Obi-Wan Kenobi here is talking to a stormtrooper and he's doing that kind of Jedi mind trick thing. Is this, is this working on you guys? <laughs> um, says, you don't need to see his identification and the stormtrooper repeats it. And then Obi-Wan says, these aren't the droids you're looking for, repeats it. He can go about his business, repeats it, move along, Stormtrooper repeats. One of these lines went massively viral, the others didn't. Which line was it? These are not the droids you're looking for, became a real meme. Here are just some things I clipped <laughs> from the internet. Uh, I like this one here, the little baby Stormtrooper saying, bye daddy, I hope you find the droids you're looking for. I don't know what that is exactly. And then here, what are they doing? The Stormtroopers are searching on Google for the droids we are looking for. Okay. And my favorite one, we do other things besides look for droids, but that's all anyone ever remembers. Okay. Now if they had said, we do other things besides look at, uh, ask for their identification, but that's all anyone remembers, that wouldn't be funny. Right? But you can see that this one line went massively viral such that you can have this whole genre of jokes based on it. Okay, now notice what we did with that set of examples. So those examples all happened in the same scene and they were right consecutive to each other and they're all spoken by the same speaker. So we have a nice kind of control there. So the idea is that what we can do is take quotes that are marked as memorable, like in uh, the IMDB, so there are people who go around saying these are memorable quotes, and we compare those with things that were said by the same person in the same scene, either above or below, but really close, okay, about the same length, because it seems like things that are shorter are obviously gonna be less, more memorable, okay, and are non-memorable. So these are gonna be our pairs of a memorable quote next to something that's in the same context said by the same person. So we've got a lot of control there. Okay, and you can ask among, so given a pair like that, now you can ask, how easy it is to tell which one goes viral, which one is gonna be memorable. Okay, and you can play around with this data yourself. It's kind of fun. Let me show you what they look like because I think without seeing what these pairs look like, you don't quite get a feeling for how hard this problem is. So 
Uh, there's actually a website, you can, I think it's still live, you can go to to kind of try this out yourself. But what we have here are pairs, left to right. They're both from the same movie, same speaker, blah, blah, blah. So let's take this thing from Jackie Brown. Consider the first quote, half a million dollars will always be missed, versus I know the tripe, trust me on this. How many people think this one was the more memorable? How many think that one? So you don't agree, right? And it can't be that some, well, you don't agree. So this idea is supposed to be that it's kind of hard. It's not just like the droids you're looking for versus you need to see his identification. Let's try the second one. I think it's time to try some unsafe velocities versus no cold feet or any other parts of our anatomy. How many say left? How many say right? More agreement there, but it's not 100%, right? So my point here is this is actually kind of hard for people. Let's take the third one. A little advice about feelings, kiddo. Don't expect it to always tickle versus I mean there's someone besides your mother you've got to forgive. Left, right, bigger split there too. Okay, so you've got to see that, I hope this is convincing you that if nothing else, what's wrong with the person next to me? They don't agree with me. <laughs> anyway, but um, I'm not actually going to tell you the answers. My whole point was simply to show you that you can have a high level of disagreement about this. It's hard for people to decide on their own. Okay. Uh, so given this setup, we can think about how, what is this problem like? So the way it's been set up, 50% would be random chance. Okay, and if people did 50% on average, that would mean that the task is impossible, meaning that there is no language signal to what is going to become more viral, right? Because you simply can't see it if all you see is the language. Whereas, suppose people were at 100% accuracy on this, which we didn't see, right? Can't, it can't be. But if it had been that, that would say, Language is all you need, right? Because all I have to do is look at how, what was said in the quote and I could decide. Okay, so we asked a bunch of people about this and it turned out that their accuracy on average was 72 to 78%, which you can see I've labeled for you, says it's an interesting task. <laughs> Specifically, it says that it's not the case that you can't tell anything from the language, right? Because then you'd be over here. But of course, there's all this other stuff that happens that determines whether a quote is memorable. I say, I'll be back, nobody cares. Arnold Schwarzenegger says, I'll be back. Everyone quotes this kind of thing, right? There's obviously things besides the language. So there's no way we could be out here. Okay, but we're right here in the middle, which is nice. Now, let me uh, quickly make another remark. Uh, you might be like, why is there a range here? Can't I count? And it's actually true that I have some trouble with it some days. But there are actually two experiments run here. This accuracy comes from a highly controlled experiment where, oh, by the way, I should point out, the subjects had to have not seen the movie. So they can't have, they, so we wanted to make sure they didn't know the context, they hadn't, you know, blah, 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 blah. So that's an important thing that I forgot to say. And that, no, 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 of course. So the idea why I wanted to show this is that I have a feeling most people haven't seen these. And that's what the data actually kind of looks like. This number here comes from an accidental bigger study. So you see that this uh, URL is up here. It turned out this actual study itself went viral. So um, the, I guess it's the highlight of my professional career, not counting giving a distinguished lecture at UW, is that <laughs> we were made fun of by Kathy Lee Gifford on the Today Show about this study. Perhaps as a result of that, 14,000 people ended up taking this test. 72% accuracy on average. It was a nice result. It was really weird. The internet is full of strange people. The comments are just, so there's one person who said, I'm an Italian speaker. Why are you asking me about movie quotes in English? I'm like, why are you taking this quiz? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but anyway, so what we've got here is we've got a really interesting task. Even if all sorts of people are doing this kind of thing, you know, we're right in the middle. Okay. Uh, so given this, now that you, I believe this points to the idea that there really is a language effect even beyond who's saying something or what's the situation in which they said it, we can now start looking for features that correspond to this or correlate with memorability. And I'll just run through some quick examples or some quick sort of upper high level findings. Uh, one is that the memorable quotes, you can compare the memorable quotes versus unmemorable quotes. On average, the memorable quotes tend to contain more surprising combinations of words according to language models built on Newswire. Okay, and so something like, these aren't the droids you're looking for, the words droids is unusual, so you might imagine it kind of sticks. Okay, and you might say this is obvious and maybe you'd be right. But on the other hand, it's useful to point out that something opposite happens if you look at the syntax. 
So at the same time, the memorable quotes are, tend to have a more common syntactic structure than the non-memorable quotes. And again, you could put a little just so story around this at the end. You could say it's because those things are easier to remember. Compare, this is from Draws, you're going to need a bigger boat, versus you're going to need a boat that is bigger. It's sort of clumsy. It's hard to imagine people saying it. Okay? So we've got this sort of surprising combination at the lexical level, but a sort of more common, more general, well, more common syntactic structure underneath. Other things we found is that the memorable quotes on average, and using a really sort of crass uh, characterization of generality, but they tend to be more portable or general in the sense of using more indefinite articles. So you're going to need a bigger boat versus you're going to need the bigger boat. You know, what boat? Were we talking about a boat? You know. Anyway, I mean, this doesn't, again, this is all on average. You can, of course, point to your favorite quote, and it's going to break these rules, so to speak. You know, this is not a prescription here, but it's just a characterization of on the average. Um, and then, of course, to get into ACL, you need some classification results. You can probably close your eyes and guess what the results are going to be like. But I'll run through this anyway. Uh, again, you're going to now take a pair of quotes and decide which, it, based, and run a machine learning algorithm and try to decide which of them is uh, uh, the memorable one. So here's bag of words using, as it happened, a smaller set of features, but so you go. 50% would have been the random choice. And bag of words is doing at about 60% accuracy. So better than random chance. So there is something in just the words that are used. Actually, it turns out to be, for some reason, the memorable quotes tend to use more swear words than otherwise. So it goes. That's what the data tells us. Now, what if we look at the features that we found? And remember, we're using a smaller set of features than the bag of words. Suppose you just use distinctiveness, this sort of notion of the lexical distinctiveness and the syntactic level of distinctiveness, which is the other way, but of course, then you can see that uh, we get an improvement over bag of words. This thing means statistically significant improvement. Uh, the generality features actually do better than random chance, but not as good as bag of words. But, and I know there's at least one InfoViz person in the room, but this is my feeble attempt at information visualization. So if we combine the horizontal stuff and the vertical stuff <laughs> to get this bar here, you get improvement uh, at a higher statistical significance level than over bag of words, and we're about halfway to where the humans were. Okay? Any questions? Yeah? What happens if you do this on a corpus that's overwhelmingly not interesting or memorable, like a <laughs> linguistics textbook or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> Someone asks, what would happen if we ran this over different data? They've suggested linguistics text as being particularly boring. I'm going to take this question and change it to, let's look at ad slogans, i.e. a different domain where you would really care about whether you can pick out whether it's going to be memorable versus not. We have a slight technical problem here is that it's hard to come up with negative examples. We don't know if Coke is it, you know, if just because sales fell, does it mean Coke is it was a bad slogan or not? But we can sort of reframe the question in the absence of negative examples as follows which is we can simply say, what are ad slogans as a body like in comparison to our memorable quotes versus our non-memorable quotes? And the results here are that the ad slogans are, in fact, closer to the memorable quotes in their lexical and syntactic characteristics. So we have some idea that given the ad quotes are presumably written in order to be memorable, among other things, uh, that the characteristics we've seen seem to be something that, at least unconsciously, are being used by these ad people. Um, something that's always fun to ask here is what was our number one according to our features? And it was uh, quality never goes out of style. Not bad, Levi's. Uh, the second, the worst one, and I always have to look because I can't even remember it. <laughs> Grace, space, pace by Jaguar. Like what? <laughs> okay, and the second worst one was corn and cluck for a buck. <laughs> All right. But anyway, so we have some idea, again, that our features, so the reason we used this ad slogan corpus was to say, do these features actually work for other things than movie quotes? And we have some evidence there seems to be something there. Uh, we also, another domain where uh, we thought this would be applicable, we actually had cut a really nice deal with Facebook where they gave us actual Facebook laptops and we accessed the data. So we did this joint work with uh, Lars Backstrom, who's a Cornell alum and now runs the feed group. So, Immensely powerful person, if you think about that. Anyway, so the idea was, well, let's look at whether things generate interest in uh, sort of social media sites. So here, obviously, we're looking at Facebook data in the first two things here. So you can look at the distinctiveness, as measured in a certain way, of a particular post 
versus how many comments does it tend to attract? Okay. And you notice that, okay, so the idea here is we have this idea of distinctiveness coming from this memorability stuff. We can now see that this distinctiveness idea also seems to be correlated with things like how much interest does something attract. The more distinctive it is, the more comments we're getting on Facebook. Modulo uh, the certain circumstances I don't want to talk about so much. This line here is doing the same thing on Wikipedia. Why is it flat? Is it flat? Yeah. <laughs> it could be that, but actually these are for the conversations. Uh, so these are the conversations. So our working hypothesis here is that Wikipedians don't decide what to discuss based on how interesting it is. They have a job to do. Okay. So the, co the context in which people are having these conversations actually matters. So there's an interesting new machine learning problem that this kind of stuff suggests, which I'd like to bring in, because I think people should work on this. So when we measured, talked about interestingness in that previous slide, we were talking about how many comments something attracts. So you can think of that as the length of a comment thread. But something that I think deserves more attention is whether a comment thread attracts a lot of attention, or a comment thread has a lot of comments just because they're kind of guest book threads. You're getting married, congratulations, 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 versus whether people are having a real conversation. And that can be measured by a notion of re-entry. This person here commented, and then they come back and comment again. And this idea of predicting re-entry is something that I think is totally unexplored, and I only have one student at a time, so I can't look at it myself, so I'm giving it out to you guys for free. I think this would be really fascinating, because trying to predict whether you're going to come back to a conversation is really useful, because that would tell you you should rank this conversation higher in that person's feed, because it's going to be something that they're going to be interested in actually participating in. Okay. So, um, I'd like to close now with my conclusion slide here. Uh, William Carlos Williams said something I kind of like. Uh, here it is. I had not yet come to the conviction. It is not what you say that matters, but the manner in which you say it. There lies the secret of the ages. Now, I haven't come completely to this conviction, but I have come to the following conclusions, which are, one, that social power relationships do affect language, even at the extremely fine-grained levels, these little meaningless function words. We're even seeing an effect there. Also, phrasing does indeed seem to have some effect on memorability and engagement. And I think this is important because it does say you should pay attention to how do you say, how you say things. Uh, furthermore, I kind of view, hope, you know, this is the bigger picture slide, that I view deeper interplay between constructing NLP-enabled systems and understanding how people use and are affected by language. Understanding the interplay between these two things is going to be a huge opportunity for all concerned, bold-faced and stuff. Um, you may have noticed that this isn't necessarily so memorably phrased. So maybe here's another better way to say it. I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Thank you. We have time for questions. So how does this generalize to different languages besides English, or did the Wikipedia data set, was that in other languages as well? The question is about, does this work only in English? My assumption is no, but I've never actually tried it. It's certainly the case if your language doesn't have determiners, you're probably not going to echo the determiners. But I actually don't know even things like, suppose we're working in a cross-cultural context with someone whose native language doesn't have determiners, tend to echo the determiners or not. Totally open, I have no idea. But we haven't tried this for, for different languages, but I sort of think this echoing stuff is a natural human phenomenon, because we do it in gesture too, right? If uh, we're getting along, you nod your head, I nod your head, I cross my arm. So Christian used to do this to me all the time. Uh -huh. He would actually, in our conversation, start nodding his head to try to see if he could get me to do it. Um, <laughs> and, you know, in some ways I'm glad he graduated. Um, in many ways I'm glad he graduated. Um, but uh, even things like, there are these studies where it actually show even a social component isn't necessarily needed. So there's studies of people watching TV where they notice a human, a person watching TV will actually echo the emotions or the gestures of the person on the TV, even though there's no actual social interaction. So I think this kind of echoing is kind of an inbuilt thing. I don't want to speculate too far into how that goes. But if you believe that, you would probably believe people in other languages do something similar. Yeah, um, all right, I hope you can hear me. Um, so I, I noticed that you work mostly with text, but kind of for memorability and things, it's, especially in movies, kind of fundamentally a speech uh, characteristic as well. Um, and I was wondering if you looked at, especially in dialogue, you know, the people were looking at a lot of uh, echoing and similar things. So I was wondering if you looked at any kind of characteristics of speech that you can deduce from the text, things like uh, prosody, like sil syllables or anything. 
So a quick question is, what about sort of speech kind of things? And I just talked to Jeff Films, who will have discovered from our conversation that I know nothing about speech. So I'm going to use even the wrong vocabulary here. But one definitely has an intuition this ought to have an effect. So, but one observation I should say is, so it's actually amazing that just from the language, without any of the kind of speech stuff, like how do you pitch or stress or things, you still have people able to pick out which is the more memorable one. That being said, I'm sure it's probably an effect. And again, I'm a small group operation kind of thing. I've been trying to get people to actually try it out. It'd be a very easy thing to do. Our data is available. So you guys have way more expertise on this. Just go ahead and try it yourself. We did do some baby kind of stuff. So things we could pick out from the text, like plosives, B and P. Those we noticed were correlated more with the uh, memorable things and things like that, but we weren't able to do anything like stress. It, again, it'd be super easy to do. Please do it. Tell me what happens. I'd, I'd be interested in knowing. Uh, just wondering, how do you actually echo someone's function words? Because uh, I've, I've never studied NLP, and I just can't construct examples uh, in my head of how you would const uh, how you would actually echo the function words that are not grammatical or some sort of actually not your, not your usual ways of speaking? Yeah, so the question is, what is it, how is one even echoing these kind of things? And it's important I've made this point about this being unconscious. Because to me, it's actually incomprehensible that you can kind of do this. And so we're just taking a, advantage of the fact that people are doing it even if we don't know how. For instance, how many prepositions were in the sentence I just said? Aren't you guys paying attention? I don't even know. I mean, you know, I'm a, little, I'm a little out of body right now when I give talks. But it doesn't seem to be something we can even consciously track ourselves. So it's just amazing to me that at an unconscious level, you can actually do this mirroring. I don't know how people are doing it, but it's just showing up in the data. They are. So there's no reason why this works. Because for the mem memorability one, uh -huh. study, you have some sort of intuitive explanation of why yeah. this works. So for the first study, you don't think there's some sort of I mean, simple point again, uh, so the question is, again, a mechanism. It's clear there is some kind of mirroring that goes on. Unconsciously, we do this gesture kind of thing. I'm just not a neuropsychologist. I'm not anything, actually, in some sense. But I, I don't know, but there's clearly something that is inherent, or I don't know if I should say that on tape. But you know, I, don't, I don't know how it's happening. But it, it seems that it happens not just on the language level, but in other levels, too. OK, sure. one more. Uh, did you take into consideration how a lot of movie quotes are actually misremembered by people? I want to do this totally. I just don't know enough examples. So for instance, so the question was, are you taking advantage of misremembered quotes? So for instance, play it again, Sam was never said. The variant that's of interest in this kind of thing is to look at what was actually said versus what was remembered. So Dorothy and the Toto quote, it's actually, I have a feeling we've not, we're not in Kansas anymore. And everyone remembers it as, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. And so you can construct, again, a just-so story. That's the one that's syntactically easier. And so that's what actually got remembered. So you could use this as a test probe. We just didn't feel we'd get enough data. Because I can think of about three examples. Well, I can only think of the one example there. Whereas here, you know, we got more examples out of IMDb. But it's been an obvious thing to look at. So thanks again.